cheese and water buffalo milk for making cheese. Um, I've never actually worked with water buffalo milk, but it is my favorite kind of cheese, uh, or my favorite kind of milk, because it has the highest fat and protein content of, of all those milks, and so uh, we all know that fat is flavor, so my two favorite food groups are sweet fat and salty fat, which is why I'm a cheese fanatic. My jokes seem funnier when I'm live. <laughs> so, um, and more specifically, we're going to be using uh, cow milk today because it's what we, most of us have access to. Um, we also, most of us are getting our milk from the store, so it's going to be uh, pasteurized and homogenized. Um, and if you don't know what those words uh, mean, homogenize is a way to get the fat to stay in the milk faster. Um, years ago, there was a milk type that they called cream top. And so as the milk would sit, usually on your porch at that time, uh, the cream would rise to the top. And uh, often people would scrape that off, use that in their coffee, and then use the, use the milk for whatever else they were doing. But um, uh, because overall people thought that that was a less appealing look to milk, we came up with homogenization, which they pass the milk through a screen that is smaller than the, than the fat that is in the milk and that breaks it up into smaller particles. And if you think of fat like a balloon, um, the bigger the balloon, the faster it's gonna rise through the air. Well, if you fill it with helium, um, and the smaller the balloon, the slower it would rise through the air. And so if you think of uh, goat milk in, con in contrast to cow's milk, a lot of times people say goat milk is naturally homogenized. It's not really homogenized, it's just that the fat molecules in it are smaller, and so they rise more slowly. So the other thing that's important in cheese making is uh, pasteurization. Pasteurization is any time that you're heating up milk over uh, 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 ab or above 141 degrees for uh, whatever length of time at that temperature you need to render it safe. And by safe, they mean biologically inactive. So when we get milk from, from the farm, there are uh, all different kinds of cultures or some pathogens that can make it through to the milk. And so when we're getting milk from the grocery store, because we want it to live on the shelf for as long as we possibly can, we will pasteurize it. Um, the most milk that you'll have access to is actually heated up what they call high temperature short time. And that's 161 degrees for about 10 to 15 seconds. And there was not going to be a quiz on this, but, um, there's also a kind of pasteurization called ultra pasteurization. An ultra pasteurization, they're heating up the milk to extremely high temperatures, past boiling point, and uh, for a very short amount of time. But that uh, actually ends up uh, affecting the milk proteins, and so we cannot make cheese from ultra pasteurized milk. Unfortunately, at the 161 that most of our milk is heated to, if it's not ultra pasteurized, it's still affecting some of the proteins. And so uh, there, are, there is a chance that your uh, mozzarella will fail. And if it does, try a different milk. Um, and don't think it's you at first. Blame the milk. Always <laughs> blame the milk. Um, the other thing that can affect the quality of the milk and whether or not your cheese is going to turn out at home is how well this milk was taken care of. So uh, the FDA allows milk to sit out for a certain amount of time at each of its transition points. And if it happens to have gotten left out on the loading dock for a little extra time, it's actually going to be slightly more acidic at its, at its starting value. And so um, when we are actually adding more acid to it, to make the cheese, we might be making it overly acidic or too acidic for the curds to form correctly. So, um, how are we doing so far? Any questions coming in? Not yet. I'm having a technical difficulty with that too, but I'll okay. work on that too. So, um, 
I'm going to assume there are no questions and we're going to keep rolling. Um, and I already mentioned sanitizing. So this gallon of milk has been out for a little bit of time, the entire time that I've been talking. And if we want to make mozzarella successfully, we want to start out with the coldest milk possible. So usually I take it straight from the fridge and pour it right into my pan right away. But um, uh, enough of that. So what do we need for our mozzarella? We're going to need some water for our rennet. We're going to need some water for our citric acid. We're going to need some way to crush our rennet tablet. And let's get started. And I already lost my rennet tablet. It's so small it went somewhere. I probably put it in my pocket so I could smuggle it home later. Is it in the mortar pestle? No. But I'll probably put it in my pocket so I can make cheese later. So if you see on the rennet tablet, I don't know like how far you can see in there, but um, it's got an X through the center and each one of those portions is good for a gallon of milk. Usually this breaks up in pretty easily, but today it's giving me some trouble. So we're going to take about a quarter of that tablet and just crush it down as fine as we can. If you don't have a mortar and pestle, I often use just the back of a spoon inside of a bowl. That seems to work pretty well. What we want to do is we want to make sure when we're grinding this up that we get it as powderized as we possibly can. Hopefully you can see in there. See no big chunks. And we're going to go ahead and stir that into one of our glasses of water. And then we do not need that anymore. Pour that. All right. And then let's stir that up. We want to make sure that this is completely dissolved. And so I'll often just stir up my rennet and kind of let that sit for a little bit and then I'll stir it again in, a, in you know, another minute or so. We're going to mix up our citric acid and then come back and stir this rennet one more time. And I don't know if you can see on the camera, but it's already starting to settle. Any questions? I want to make sure I'm not going too fast for people too, because I know when I'm watching cooking shows, or any other how-to show, they're always going so fast because they've done it a million times. And me, I'm still trying to figure out which end is up. Um, so by the time they're pulling something out of the oven, I've got my flour out of the cabinet. So next we're going to take our citric acid. And we are going to be going, uh, should be a, a uh, one and a half teaspoons on that. Am I correct? Yes. So I know another silly thing is sometimes people think that would be a half teaspoon. We want to make sure that we are measuring these nice and level so that we get the right amount of citric acid. What we're doing is we're adding acid to our milk using citric acid and so uh, if we're not measuring carefully, we're going to either have too much acid or too little acid to make our milk curd. Ta -da. And then let's stir that. It's so exciting. <laughs> My wife has watched me make so much cheese through the years, she could probably make the cheese herself by now. 
<laughs> Is that true? It's true, but I'd rather have you make it. <laughs> you can't see her right now, but she's supervising. <laughs> so do you want to hear my cheese joke? Yes. <laughs> what did the one cheese curd say to the other cheese curd? What? You're in my way. Oh. <laughs> Now, if you, you see we're coming back to our rennet, and you see how a bunch of it settled at the bottom, we do not want that. We want to make sure that all that rennet gets into the milk. So we're going to stir this one more time. Do not get your citric acid and rennet confused. I've had some people tell me that they've kind of poured them all in together in the past because they didn't know which was which, and your cheese is not going to work well that way. Give that another stir and let it sit again. All right, so we are ready. We have everything ready to go. I have a um, question. Yes. If you did confuse which is which, is there a way to tell by maybe tasting? Sometimes it? yes, sometimes no. You could dab into both of them. The rennet's not going to hurt you, nor is the citric acid. The citric acid is definitely going to taste tart. Okay. So, um, but you can also see if you put them next to each other when you're using tablet rennet, the uh, the rennet is going to be. My, uh, have a tint to it. If you're using a liquid rennet, you, they look almost identical. Um, that is a very good question. Thank you. So, few things in are most people think they know how to stir, but in cheese making, it's very important that we learn how to stir properly. A lot of times, people think that if they if if they're stirring around and around and around, they're stirring well. What they're actually doing is just pushing everything around in, the, in a circle in their pot. Um, it, it, sometimes it's easy to visualize if you think like if the pot were filled with marbles and you put a spoon in and, and went in a circle, you know that you would just be pushing those marbles all in the same direction. What we do in cheese making is we lift. So we're going to stir like this. I'll do a little bit of that, but mostly I'm doing this, and you're going to see when you're doing it at home how much more turbulence that's going to make in your milk than, than this will do. This pushes it around, this actually stirs it. Um, another, uh, another thing where you might run into some issue when we get started is a lot of times people think if they pour their citric acid in first and then their milk that that's going to stir it in really well. But what ends up happening is, since this is high acid and this is neutral, those first few drops of milk that go into that acid are going to be very acidic. And we do not want to do that in cheese making. We want everything to kind of have equal opportunity to be, uh, to get mixed in and have all the ingredients spread around before they introduce the action that they're going to do. So let's talk one more thing. What do we need to make cheese? A lot of times people will, will uh, say, oh, I need rennet, I need uh, salt, but those are, yes, we do use those ingredients in cheese making, but the three things that we have to have to make cheese, in fact, the only three things we really need to make cheese is milk, that's curdable, um, heat, Hopefully this will work and we'll get heat and acid. And for our demonstration today, our, and the acid we're going to use in both of our cheeses is going to be citric acid. So first we're doing, we're going to pour in our milk. Cheese making is very messy, especially the way I do it. I'm going to check my digital thermometer, and I like to make sure that the milk I'm starting with is below 50 degrees, and we are good right now. We're reading 48, 47, and it's still dropping a little bit, so that's fantastic. And I'll go more on that as we progress. Next, we have our, our citric acid water and my 
stirring spoon, and here we go. Ready? Let the cheese making begin. Notice I don't have the heat on. I'm stirring up and down. And as soon as that is all mixed, How are we doing? I think that's How are we doing, Paul? We're doing good. Okay, we're doing better there. This is Gina from the technical support team, and our live chat is not working, and I apparently cannot turn it on midstream. So, if you have a question, you can text it to me at gina at venissimo.com, and I'll answer questions that way. Perfect. My apologies. Don't know what happened. You know... I've done enough events that I know something happens every event, so at least we know what it is this time. <laughs> Ta -da. All right, so let's add some heat. We have our milk, we have our heat, and we have our acid. So pretty soon we'll have cheese. Okay, it's a little more complicated than that. We're starting today with the hard cheese mozzarella. It is the most finicky of all the cheeses to make, and I've made a lot of cheeses. And then uh, we're gonna finish the day with the easiest cheese there is to make, ricotta. And, um, there's a, there's a saying that if you can't make ricotta, you don't belong in the kitchen. Um, and I think that's true because I think if, we've, if any of us have tried to make a cream sauce in the past and had it curl on us, we've actually made ricotta. It might not have been the tastiest or best ricotta you ever had in your life, but yes, if you've curdled a cream sauce, you've made ricotta. Um, all right, there is a lot of waiting in cheese making. And there's, uh, there is a lot of what I would call target points that we have to be aware of when we're making cheese. And so with our uh, mozzarella, the first target that we're looking for is that our milk is below 50 degrees when we get started. The second uh, target temperature that you should see in your uh, instructions is going to be around 86 degrees. Should be in here somewhere. Um, uh, the instructions say 88. I usually aim for about 86. You turn off the heated around then, it's going to rise a few more degrees. You want to make sure that, that your first target, you're keeping it below about 90 degrees tops. Um, and if you're following along, you might notice that at this point there might be a, a few small curds that have formed from the acid in the milk already. And if that's happening to you, then just make sure that we're keeping a good stir on this. Um, the more you keep this moving, the, the more you're going to sort of uh, move the heat around. And so we're creating no spots in this pot where there's uh, more heat than any other spot, if that makes sense. In the same way that, we're, that we were mixing in our acid as quickly as we could, uh, without creating high acidic areas, we're also moving the heat around so we're not creating high heat areas. I hope that all makes sense. Are any questions rolling in? Not yet. We need some questions, but I think I'm, I'm still working on fixing Yep, cool. Then I must be doing a brilliant job. <laughs> what does your shirt say? My shirt says? Oh, yes. If you don't talk to your kids about cheese, who will? <laughs> You can, can I get one of those t-shirts? You have one of those t-shirts. Yes, I do. But if you didn't already have one of those t-shirts, <laughs> where could you get one? You could get one at venissimo.com. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably need a second one, don't you? Yeah, I yeah. only have one. Because, I mean, if you want to wear it every time you leave the house, it's true. then you're going to need a few more. 
speaking of cool cheese stuff. You know what's really cool, Paul? What's really cool? Live chat is now live. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Let the questions so, roll in. <laughs> so if you're not having audio issues, you can hear that live chat is now working. If you are, are having audio issues, um, you can chat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are you mixing now again? So this is the rennet, and I'm giving it another stir. I really just want to make sure this is all dissolved. In the same way that we were uh, trying to avoid having too much acid in one spot or too much heat in one spot, we are going to try and make sure we don't have too much rennet in one spot when we get ready to pour this in. I am guessing my spider sense says that we're getting close to our temperature. See and how we're doing. I've got a yes. question, Paul. Yes. Did you already talk about the rennet and where it came from? Uh, I did not. Mm. <laughs> Do you think people might like to know? Was... Would you like to know about that? <laughs> yes, I would. Rennet is fun. Rennet is really just an enzyme. And uh, right now we're at 76 degrees, so we have about 10 more degrees to go. Um, so before I talk about rennet, I like to actually talk about what a cheese is, or more specifically, what is a cheese curd? So we've all heard of curds and whey, and all we're doing with curds and whey, or uh, when we're making cheese, is we're separating the pro uh, some of the proteins and the fats from the water, and the water part of uh, the cheese making process is the whey, the solid part are the curds. And curds are cool. They're like these, um, so I'm a science geek so I think it's cool, but they're like a protein cage that traps fat in the middle. And if you were listening earlier when I said my two favorite food groups are sweet fat and salty fat, it's like cheese is the perfect food. It's fat wrapped in protein. So, um, so I, I do have a question uh -huh. from K Goods. Okay. Um, so, if rennet isn't one of the three ingredients uh -huh. mentioned, uh -huh. um, what does using it do for the cheese making process? We are about to go Almost there. there. Yep. We Excellent. are about to go there. So, when I say that we only need those three ingredients to make cheese, that is the fundamental, most basic cheese. There are a lot of things that we can do to make cheese in slightly different ways to come up with the literally thousands of varieties of cheese or described cheeses that are out there. Um, uh, rennet is one of the ways that we can, one of the things that we can use in the cheese making process that will change the texture of the outcome which changes the kind of cheese that it is. So back to what is a cheese curd, because this is important with rennet. Um, it's a protein, uh, and those proteins are casein proteins that trap fat in the middle. And the reason why you don't see chunky milk in the grocery store is because all of those proteins have the same charge. So imagine, if you will, um, a number of, uh, if you had a bowl full of magnets, and they were all north-facing magnets, or all positive charge magnets, they're all going to try and stay as far away from each other as they possibly can. We have hit our first target. So I'm going to turn off the heat. And again, that target, Paul, was? Um, was 86 degrees. We turned it off, and uh, we actually went to 88 degrees on this. And your target temperatures are in your instructions. So. Um, uh, rennet. So the acid, when you're adding acid to your, uh, your milk, what you're doing is you're actually neutralizing that charge. And so the casein proteins can then sort of like bump into each other and start to like each other and stick together and trap that fat. When you're adding rennet to your, uh, to your milk, it actually takes off the ends of the proteins where that charge is 
then removing the charge so they can start bumping into each other and liking each other and creating that cage and, and trapping the fat. Um, what's really fun is that we are ready to add our rennet. Hopefully everybody is at about the same temperature. If not, follow your milk, not my milk. And if I need to repeat any of this stuff, I can go ahead and repeat it as necessary so that your mozzarella turns out as wonderful as my mozzarella is gonna turn out. So I'm gonna give this a really good stir so that there's nothing sitting in the bottom. I don't wanna leave any rennet behind. And we're going to add this as quickly as we possibly can. Look, clean. All of our rennet made it in. So we have about 30 seconds or so to stir this really well, and then we kind of want to just leave it alone. And we're going to let this rest for roughly five minutes. Do you want to let me know when five minutes is? Yes. <laughs> so a pop, is rennet always in tablet form? No. Rennet, uh, rennet comes in a few different styles and a few different forms. There are three main types of rennet. One is an animal rennet, one is a vegetable rennet, and the other one is what they call a vegetarian rennet or a microbial rennet. Um, the animal rennet is the traditional rennet. It actually comes from stomach lining. And so uh, way back when they were first making cheese, uh, there's a lot of uh, myth about where cheese first originated. But at some point, uh, after cheese making was established, they realized that if you took a little piece of the stomach, put it in the milk, that, one, that is what started the curding, and eventually we learned that there was an enzyme in that stomach lining that, uh, that we needed, and that enzyme was called rennet. It sounds a little gross, but I really like cheese, so I don't even pay attention to that. <laughs> um, the next is uh, like a, a vegetable or plant-based rennet, and that's usually thistle rennet. There are some other plants that you can make rennet from, it, thistle rennet is an uncommon rennet to use because it creates these sort of off flavors, especially when used with cow's milk. And since cow's milk is probably the largest production milk on the planet, um, if you have a rennet that makes cow's milk taste bad, you're probably not going to use it. Um, there are some traditional cheeses that have to have thistle rennet in order to be called that kind of cheese. Um, usually they're Spanish in origin, but um, uh, I've, I've never actually worked with this old rennet. I've thought about making my own, I just haven't done it yet. Um, and then lastly, the rennet that I use most often is a vegetarian rennet or a microbial rennet. Um, uh, we've taught little microbes to make the enzyme for us, and then uh, we Blah, blah, blah. I just I just derailed my thinking but um, what I was gonna say is uh, the microbial rennet is very very common a lot of times people will uh, not specify that it's animal or or vegetarian rennet on the label um, because there is a stigma as I suppose associated between the way it's always been done and this more newfangled way to do things but it is twice the strength for the same price and so it is one of the more common rennets used, especially in commodity cheeses. So if your mozzarella and my mozzarella are at around the same point, you should see that this is starting to get a little custardy. So the oven's still on. Do you want that in the stove? It's it's on really low. Okay. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. If you, can, if you can see in there all, seeing white on white is sometimes very difficult, but you can see how this is starting to turn to custard and, and very, very difficult to see on camera. But right where I pulled up my spoon, we'll start to see some separation where some liquid is separating from the curd. And that liquid is actually the whey starting to form. 
So this is good news, right? This is see very this. good news. Woo! We we have at this point we've made the base for ice cream. Okay. Yes. <laughs> if all else fails, ice cream for all. Okay. Ice cream for all. Um, uh, which is another good uh, jumping point to have a quick uh, yeah, talk about talk about Reddit. And that is, there is a Rennet you can get in the grocery store, store known as Junket Rennet. And for cheese making, Junket Rennet is junk. Um, <laughs> it is uh, really only used for making custards and ice creams and those kinds of things. And it has a slightly different uh, chemical makeup to the cheese making Rennet that we are using. And so it, your chances of success working with that rennet is really low. Um, I have heard of people that have had success with it, but um, it's not worth it's not worth it. Um, <clears throat> All righty. Fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds. That's close enough. <laughs> it's already on, so you just got to turn it. There we go. So I'm going to turn this on a, a, a lower heat. For a couple of reasons. One is I'm not using a double boiler. That's official. <laughs> I'm not using a double boiler, and so I don't want it to scorch. If I were doing this at home um, and I had all the time in the world, I would probably be using a double boiler that'll slow down our process a little bit. But um, uh, plus, if I burn my mozzarella, you won't know. So. Um, <laughs> Can you use a sous vide? Uh, I do use a sous vide. If you know what a sous vide is, it's actually um, uh, some. It's a fancy food gadget or kitchen gadget that uh, you use to cook in a water bath. So it's like having a double boiler, except it is it has very very precise measurements. And so if you set a sous vide to 88 degrees, it's going to bring your water or whatever you're heating up to exactly 88 degrees and leave it there. And if you're making more advanced cheese, which I'm hopefully uh, through this process getting you really encouraged to, to go into things like trying to make gouda or cheddar. Um, but I use the sous at home quite often because when you're making a more advanced cheese, you have very specific target points that are very specific. You want, uh, an example might be, you have to hit 86 degrees in 30 minutes and then get to 90 degrees over the course of 45 minutes. And so uh, if you do it differently, you'll still end up with cheese. You just won't end up with the cheese you intended to make. To make. But then are you saying, mm -hmm. Paul, that all cheese really starts, almost all of them, with this exact start? If you can make mozzarella, you can make any other cheese. This is the hardest cheese I've ever had to make. It is the most prone to failure, the hardest cheese. Um, okay. Yeah, everything else is a walk in the park. <laughs> yeah. So, if you guys can see on the camera at all, right now, we're actually, you can see how tight the curds are forming to the point where if you watch me put my spoon around the edge, I was breaking it away so you could see the, uh, the, the way better. See how the curd is just like one big custard um, don't you want custard now? That looks fabulous. <laughs> right? <laughs> I gotta and say, then, I'm then impressed, you have Paul. The, then you have the whey, and the whey looks nice and clear, slightly greenish, slightly yellow. No way. No way. Yes way. You're in my way. <laughs> Get out of my way. <laughs> so, unnecessary for making mozzarella, regardless of what you might see in other YouTube channels, but um, a lot of people will cut their curds. I'm going to use the, uh, uh, the length of my um, analog thermometer to show you how to cut curds, assuming that you're going to want to make some more advanced cheeses in the future. So you're just going to go through, and you'll notice it's kind of spinning because it's pulled away from the side of the pot, but we're actually going to just create like a checkerboard at a slight angle. So we're creating a checkerboard. And what is this doing, Paul, when you're cutting the curve? So we're like actually this? creating more surface area. And so um, your recipe, or your make, as it's called in the cheese world, is going to tell you what size curves you need to cut them into. So it might say, cut them into half-inch cubes, 
or quarter inch cubes or one inch cubes and what that's going to do is that is going to um, create surface area around all the things around all the pieces of, of curd and it's going to allow more or less whey to come from the curd and that is going to uh, determine how much moisture is left which is going to determine what the cheese is in the future. How is that? Good. That's your question. <laughs> any, any other questions? If you guys notice this is like our curds are very well separated and very custardy at this point and our whey is very clear and very yellow. This is very good mm -hmm. cheese so far. If it's not, Paul, would you heat it a little more heat? What so could you we are, do? So we are currently bringing this up to our next okay. target point. And that resting, the letting, the, letting the rennet sit for five minutes, um, this actually is looking like it might be close to temperature already. Um, letting letting the uh, the milk rest before we started heating it up again was actually giving the rennet a little bit more time to work. The recipe that we're working with today is often called 30 minute mozzarella, which is true. You can make this in 30 minutes, um, not including cleanup. That's about another half hour. <laughs> but. Um, uh, we actually, I find that you have a better success rate by slowing this process down a little bit. To give you an idea, traditional mozzarella, we actually are at target temperature. So I aimed for 103 in this, uh, in this class. Um, and I'll, I'll go over that in one sec. Backtrack. What was I saying? <laughs> uh, 103? Um, before 103. Slowing it down. Oh yes, we're slowing down the cheese making process. Because um, uh, traditionally mozzarella, you would uh, add the add the milk, warm it up, add the rennet or add the cultures, and then add the rennet, and those cultures will consume the lactose and and turn that lactose into acid. So where we added citric acid, when you're when you're using a culture, that culture is creating the acid for us. What that effect has is when you're making traditional mozzarella, um, you the acid is coming after the rennet and it's developing slowly. When we're making this fast version of mozzarella, the acid comes first and it's all at once, and then the rennet. And what that ends up doing is our curds are forming very quickly, and so they're not forming well. They're not perfect curd forms. Um, traditional mozzarella, which I very, very rarely make at home because if I start at 10 a.m., I'm probably not actually stretching cheese until about midnight, 1 o'clock, because it takes a long time for that acid to develop. Um, and so this is the mozzarella that I make at home most of the time. So uh, let's talk. Are we all good on all of those things? Any questions so far? We are. Should we give away a prize, Paul? Maybe with one of the. Um, let's talk about questions? temperature and then yeah. let's. Okay. Um, we need a good, hard question because we have cool prizes. Yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, our temperature, our, our second target temperature, we want to be somewhere between 102 and honestly about 115 and the reason why there's such a broad range there is because uh, the higher the temperature the more uh, moisture is going to be released from the curds so the firmer those curds will be so if you want super soft deli style mozzarella you want to aim more towards the 102 if you're making mozzarella to put on your pizza then you probably want to aim for a higher temperature, 110 to 115. Um, all righty, so shall we see how our curds look? Yes. yes. This, is, this is the fun part. <laughs> so here's where we're going to take a look at what our curds look like, and we're going to try and determine what the next step is for us to do. So 
these are kind they're starting to firm up a little bit but they're still really really soft and you want them a little firmer I like want they them seem a little, little soft to you. I want them a little bit firmer and this mm -hmm. is probably another hard thing to see on the on the camera but I want to be able to push in and feel a little bit of bounce mm -hmm. and so because I'm not feeling much bounce I know a couple of things I know one is I'm not starting off with the best milk the second thing that, that that could cause this problem, but I know isn't the case, is I could be working with old rennet. So if your curds are still really soft, then, um, then we're going to let that just hang out in the warm way for a little while and let those firm up. If your curds are already firm, then you can go on to the next step and I'll show you what that is while we wait for my curds to firm up a little bit more. Before we do that, really quick, yes. Paul got another oh. question. What about burrata? Is that dependent on the temperatures? Is it temperature dependent um, or how does burrata fit into the mix? So remind me and we'll go, actually let's, why don't we make that a question? Uh -huh. What should we get? Should we give away? I think a pocket grater. A pocket grater. Yeah. So, so, what is your question? Who can tell me what burrata is? Ah, so send your answers so, to what is burrata. So this is so what what is burrata? The first correct or closest to correct answer we get, you will win a life is great pocket grater. Anyone? Not yet. Anyone? I will let the cat out okay. of the bag and tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll give them a minute. Go ahead and talk yes. to the other. I'll watch and let you know. Alrighty. So, if your curds are ready to come out of, uh, of the pot, if they're firm, so in other words, if you can pull them up and there's a little bit of bounce to them, um, they feel like they have some solidity and they're not mushing under your fingers, then... Um, you can go ahead and line your colander with your butter muslin, your cheesecloth, and just scoop them out and pour them in. We're going to let ours sit for just a few more minutes. It's really good that this happened because if things go too well during class, then you don't know how to fix it at home if you have the same mistakes. So we've got three answers. Ooh. One thought it might be soft cow milk, one thought burrata might be the enzyme, and one thought that burrata might be buffalo milk mozzarella. Ooh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, there is buffalo milk burrata, which is absolutely scrumptious. Um, um, and so those are all kind of... That's what I said. Yeah, close, but all not kind right. of close. I'm looking for another answer. And if you're already given an answer, you can try again. Of course. We'll keep yep. going with the burrata because we'll the answer will we'll become forthcoming, going. right? Yes. 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 So, um, may I ask Paul on the cheesecloth? Uh -huh. uh, I know that there's the butter muslin, which is very cottony. Uh -huh. and there's also kind of the more, I want to call it plastic uh, uh, type. Yep. Better, better or worse? There is, um, in my mind, almost no difference. Uh, I, there's a, I guess it's a nylon uh, cheesecloth. And the only reason why I don't use that is it tends to tear a little bit easier than the cloth one does. I find it's easier to clean and reuse that one, but this one, you might see a little bit of lint on it because we just rinse it off really well in cold water and put it right in with our laundry, and then I sanitize it before I use it again. Um, but uh, yeah, so the nylon one Either works one. well. I just find if I'm making things like paneer uh, where I need to put some pressure on it, then it's more apt to tear on me. Okay. Quick question. Yes. Um, on the rennet, um, it seemed, it, did you mix more than the quarter cup than what was in the direction of the water? With that was about tap? a quarter cup. It really so was the, amount, the amount of water that you're mixing it in isn't uh, really a rocket science measurement. Okay. Um, so you can have a little more or less water with your rennet. You can have a little more. Okay. I wouldn't, I would do more, not less. 
So what I'm noticing here is we have some curds that are well formed and then you can see some curds that are not well formed. And so we're going to blame the milk for this. So you see so like some of these are fairly dense and you can kind of play with them and that's not going to dissolve but some of these are, are a lot more gooey so we're going to let this sit just a little bit longer so the longer it sits paul the more we're firm it could the moisture out okay yep. no we could do a few things we could heat it up a little bit more we can just let it sit in the way but if we don't end up with nice firm curds, then it's not going to stretch at our next step. Ooh. And we don't want that to happen. So patience is patience, a virtue in cheesemaking. Patience cheese is important. <laughs> and um, one of the things that, that I, you know, uh, that I want to tell you about this is a lot of times people will get to this point and think that their mozzarella has failed. And... Uh, in most circumstances, I would say you're correct, but one of the reasons why you're taking this class from me is so that I can tell you, no, it hasn't failed. There's still hope. We can get, we can get mozzarella out of this after all. <laughs> um, just, just so you know, if it really does fail, if we end up with mush at the other end that doesn't really want to stretch, um, there's nothing wrong with taking that mush, adding some garlic and basil to it, and calling it a spread. As long as, <laughs> as, long as you didn't tell all of your friends that you're out serving mozzarella, then you're still good. They won't know the difference. It'll taste good on a cracker. Um, One other question, Paul, yes. on the, the state of the curds. Uh -huh. um, can you describe a little bit more on what is firm and what is not firm? And he says his is still a bit gooey. So... If it's, so um, if you can lift it up and it will kind of hold its shape, so see that that right there, that I would call firm. Okay. Because you see how it's kind of, it's not really turning into goo, mm -hmm. but like I'm looking at this stuff over here that I can't even pick up. So that's gooey. And that's, that's gooey. Um, and so, so for that, you're still of, saying time. More time. I'm going to give this a little bit more time, and I will tell you, so our milk was probably a little overly acidic when we started. And so, um, uh, and or something else, like it's possible that this particular batch of milk was heated up closer to 180 degrees as opposed to the 161. All of those things will affect how well those curds form. And so by resting our, uh, our, our during that process, the five minutes mm -hmm. that we waited and uh, and the waiting now that we're doing, this is giving those, cord, those curds a little more time to try and form correctly. And Paul, we have a winner on the burrata. Yay! We want to chat about burrata and how wonderful it is. Do you want to tell us all what the winning answer was? Yes, burrata is the mozzarella on the outside filled with cream and shredded mozzarella on the inside. That is absolutely <laughs> correct. And when you make that out of buffalo milk, it's called burrata di bufala. And when you make a mozzarella out of buffalo milk, it's called mozzarella di bufala which is different than buffalo mozzarella. Buffalo mozzarella is something that originated, I believe, in New York City as a way to try and sell these larger balls of mozzarella and make you think it was the traditional mozzarella from Italy. So it's uh, size, always quality <laughs> better than size, right? I, I want, <laughs> when I want water buffalo mozzarella, nothing else will do. Yes. <laughs> right? So we're going to give this to you. Yes, to at, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, KG Goods. Yay! KG Goods. Yay! KG Goods. And I'll connect with you after to distribute this. Yes. Yes. Score. So one winner. <laughs> All right, so our curds are probably getting to the point where they're the best they're going to be. Notice I lift and they're, they are kind of holding together as best as they can. I am going to gently, did I emphasize gently enough? I'm going to gently put these into my butter muslin. Ta-da! And I am going to make a mess of this kitchen. There is no way to make cheese and not be messy. 
It is just the nature of the beast. Don't cheesemakers, Paul, say that uh, cheese making is 10% making, 90% cleaning? Oh, it's more than that. More than that. <laughs> Even more than that. Maybe than we that. shouldn't tell that till the end. <laughs> and it's like, it's like maybe half a percent eating. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. It, doesn't that always seem that when you're cooking food that, you know, what you spend like eight hours making takes about 15 minutes to Gobble. eat. Yeah. yeah. And that's especially true when you're making cheese. Yes. Because I currently have a cheese in my cheese cave. It's a Gouda that I've decided I'm going to eat when it turns seven. Ooh. And it's how old is it? Four or five? I think it's. I think it just turned. Five. I think it turned five years old this February. So another two years, and we're gonna break into it. So that's seven seven years of waiting for you know. <laughs> how, how big is it? How much? Geez? It's a four pound wheel. Four pounds. By the time by the time it's done aging, it's gonna probably be actually lose the better part of a pound. So. Um, and it looks really old and craggy right now too. It has like mold on parts of it, and start. It's got a few cracks are forming, which is normally considered a flaw. But when you're a home cheese maker, sometimes you overlook those little flaws, and you call them beauty marks. <laughs> well, that's what I do. <laughs> With yeah. me. So we're going to let this continue to strain. And let's see if I can get a little bit more of the mozzarella out of there. So a question that you're probably typing in right now, but I'm going to head it off for you, is how come I'm not just pouring this all through? And the reason for that is it creates so much turbulence, it's going to rip our curds to shreds, and we want to be really gentle with our curds. If you'll see, I asked, as someone asked before, what a good stiff curd would look like, a good firm curd. These are awesome. Oh, nice. Do you see that? Were those that, more at the bottom or those, just happened to they be They just happened to be like, they've been okay. sitting in there longer than okay. anything else. Mm -hmm. So as we strain this out, you'll notice that some of the, you know, the firmer ones will stay behind and the super soft stuff will just float on through. And that is not my fault, it's not your fault. We're blaming that solely on the milk. Um, Tell us about why not ultra pasteurized, why it cannot be that. Um, ultra pasteurized, so when we talked about pasteurization, um, so ultra pasteurized is when they heat milk up to really high temperatures. Unfortunately, that usually means organic milk or alternative milks like goat milk or sheep milk that you might find in the grocery store. These are almost always ultra pasteurized. That gives the milk a little more shelf life, but it also does what we call denaturing the proteins. And what that means to a cheesemaker is the whey proteins, you know, like the stuff that you have in your protein powder, the whey proteins start to, um, let's say, like the casein proteins, and so they start getting in on the party that's making the, the cheese curds, and they keep the caseins from forming curds correctly. So, um, it's like when, when your neighbors come over and crash your party. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you get a little closer, cameraman, to get a closer shot of the good curds? Just to give one more shot of what really is a good curd, because she mm. feels hers are all super formed. What so, about that? Yep, if they're, they're super, super formed, formed, then she is starting with good milk. What kind of milk did she start with? Ooh, can you share, Michelle? Um, how? What milk you use? I will type in. But if you've got great formed curds, we would love to know. That is about all of the curds that we are going to get out of there. One more question, Paul, while we're looking for the type of milk, uh -huh. is what if the curds look a little bit more cottage cheesy, so smaller bits maybe? 
So if they're smaller bits, that is one of the signs of bad milk. That's kind of what I'm having now. Mm -hmm. And so that, that cottage cheese sort of look, mm -hmm. you'll see if, if you can see in the camera, this almost looks a little cottage cheesy at the moment. Um, that is why we let it hang out in the way a little extra time. It's also why we're going to let it strain a little extra time in our cheesecloth. And we're going to get as much moisture out of those as we can so that when we go to our next step, um, we will have a successful stretch. And our answer, Paul, is vitamin D milk from Vons. So it was the one that has had the super oh, curve today. Is that today. the Lucerne? Uh, is... It says pasteurized and homogenized. Uh huh. And it's fun. It's fun as Lucerne, right? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So that's a good tip. Uh, yeah. Bond as Lucerne seems to be working. And just so you guys know, a lot of people want me to tell them exactly what the best milk to use is. And I have had successes and failures from every single brand that's out there. I will tell you though, because I, I don't really feel comfortable promoting a particular brand. But I will say that a non-ultra pasteurized milk that usually costs me about six to seven dollars a gallon is the one that works most often. <laughs> and I'll just let you do your shopping from there. Also, um, we found the best success when we frequent a store that had high turnover. That's about. true. Let's talk about that a little bit because that's actually a really good. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Um, so the best success we ever had was um, there was a, 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 a store right down the street from us, a tiny little convenience store, and they only held like four to six gallons of milk at a time, and they got it delivered every single day. And so I would go in there and wipe them out. But <laughs> So fresher is better. Fresher is better. And I'll give you another trick. And if you shop for milk the same day I do, before me, I'm going to be upset at you. <laughs> um, but uh, my trick for buying milk, everyone thinks you want to reach all the way to the back. But don't reach all the way to the back. Grab the milk that's in the middle of all the other milks. Because it's been protected from the front of the house and the back of the house by all the other milks. And the really smart people that work in the grocery store know that everyone wants the milk from behind. So they will sometimes put their oldest milk back there, knowing that people are going to reach back thinking that they're getting the, the freshest milk. But um, if all you really have is a few gallons to choose from, check the date. And you want the freshest or the furthest away expiration or sell-by date. Um, to use for, uh, for, your, for your mozzarella. For ricotta, I've only had ricotta fail on me a few times, and strangely enough, I've had ricotta fail for me from the milk that we're using today. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> but, and that goes, that goes to tell you that like the milk that we're using today is a milk that I've used quite often, and I've had great successes, and um, and really bad failures from from this milk, uh, and so it's just it's going to happen to you. Always blame the milk, never blame yourself. <laughs> um, and all I'm doing when I'm moving this cloth around is I'm allowing uh, I'm just kind of moving it gently and allowing the whey to drain out a little bit faster. But you'll see that's getting nice and firm. We're getting some. Some nice curds in there. Are, should right? they be sticking together? At they this should point? be sticking together. So um, a few things. Did I already mention that a recipe in cheese making is called a make? And when cheese curds start to uh, uh, kind of glue themselves together, that's called knitting. And as you get more into cheese making, you will uh, you'll see those terms over and over again. What does your cheese make? What does your make say? And uh, letting, your, letting your curds knit together. So right now, we are letting our curds uh, drain and we're also allowing them to knit together. So is anybody at home having a problem at this point or is everyone pretty much in the same boat I am? 
It looks like, Paul, we've got some super curders and we've still got some softies. Yep. Um, giving it a little more time. I see a combination. Alrighty. So, the softies, I hope those come together for you because mozzarella or fresh mozzarella is one of my absolute favorite cheeses to make. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. Um, so, uh, I will tell you a fun game to play is making your own pizza from scratch. And this is, this is how I figured out to do it. You make your dough. Your dough is going to take about an hour or so to rise. So you start your dough, and while that's rising, you make your mozzarella. While your mozzarella is cooling off a little bit, you can make your sauce and your veggies and pre prepare everything that you want to put on your pizza. By then, your dough's usually risen. You can roll that out, maybe pre-bake it for a couple of minutes. Um, but you can make mozzarella from the barest of ingredients and have it ready to go in an hour and a half. It is spectacular. And um, that is one of those things, don't invite people over because you're gonna eat it all yourself. <laughs> um, it's okay to be stingy with your homemade cheese. If you guys can see that these curds are coming together real nicely. So, uh, you know, what we're gonna do at this point is Let's, let's let these hang out and drain, and let's start our ricotta. How's that sound? Yes, pray tell, what is ricotta? Is anybody out there having an issue that we need to step in real fast? I don't see or any is, issues. Or is anyone ready to make ricotta? Yes. Let's, let's go. So, for ricotta, we are going to get all of our things together. We need our gallon of milk. We need our citric acid and we need some water. Um, someone asked the question about how much water and I want to maybe go into that in a hair more detail because I'm not sure if I actually answered it uh, well. But um, you probably don't want less than a quarter cup and probably not more than let's say three quarters of a cup. This is probably close to half a cup or so. Um, what you want is you want to uh, dilute your ingredients so that they're not so concentrated. So when we're talking about not having too much acid in one spot or too much heat in one spot, if you're not using enough water, you're going to have too much of your acid or rennet in a concentrate. And so that's going to affect how quickly and how well it will stir into the rest of your ingredients. Um, if you have too much water, you're just adding extra moisture into your cheese, which for the cheeses we're making today isn't a big deal, but I want to give you best practices. Um, so hopefully that's good on that. And we had a Reddit question, I feel like I answered that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. The burrata question. So, um, burrata is just a fantastic way to add more fat to your food because fat tastes wonderful. Um, so uh, traditionally they would take yesterday's mozzarella because they didn't want to um, eat yesterday's mozzarella because that was yesterday's and why should we have yesterday's mozzarella when we could eat today's <laughs> great mozzarella. <laughs> the Italians, of course. <laughs> but when you're poor and you don't want to throw away the stuff you don't want to eat, you find a way to sort of repurpose it. And uh, I don't remember when burrata came into existence, but it's a relatively new cheese. Um, but they would literally uh, shred the mozzarella. You've, we've all had string cheese. String cheese is a form of mozzarella or a pasta filata, which means stretched cheese. So they would just shred the mozzarella and take some of the cream. Remember we talked about cream top cheese and how the cream rises to the top. They'll take that cream, skim it off, mix it with the mozzarella curds, and then when they're stretching their mozzarella, they'll make a, a thin sheet and stuff the uh, stuff some of the, uh, the yesterday's mozzarella and cream mixture in there and then close it off. So it is cream and mozzarella wrapped in mozzarella. Who to thought? <laughs> now, if you're really inventive and um, but you don't really want to remind your wife that you can do this, but you're going to do it anyway because she's sitting over there. Um, oh, I remember. <laughs> you can wrap all kinds of things in your mozzarella. Um, 
for example, my favorite was I did a sun-dried tomato pesto, and I chilled it off in balls, and then wrapped that in the mozzarella, and my mouth is water, I'm just thinking about it. It was pretty darn good. Yes. So let's turn to our ricotta recipe. Fresh and fluffy ricotta. Now I have some, I'm going to teach you how to make fluffy ricotta, but today we are going to make a more dense ricotta and I'll tell you why. I use fluffy ricotta when I'm going to serve it on a cracker or when it's going to be the showcase. Um, I make a denser ricotta when I'm going to put it in a lasagna or if I'm going to make paneer or ricotta salada out of it. Um, but I'm going to teach you the secret to making fluffy ricotta even though together we're going to make a more dense ricotta and we're going to turn that into paneer today um, because I want paneer for dinner. <laughs> so, <clears throat> What's the difference between ricotta and ricotta salad? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, ricotta is, ricotta means recooked. So traditionally they would take um, the leftover whey from making the mozzarella and they would heat it up to a really high temperature, occasionally adding more cream or milk to the whey and occasion, uh, occasionally adding you know, more and more whey from other batches, um, or like yesterday's whey, which would be more acidic than today's whey. But in any case, I almost said by, uh, anyway, um, in any case, they would reheat it, and that would cause every last little bit of cheese that was left in the whey to separate out, and that was, that's the origin of ricotta. So recooked. They, they cook the, the milk to make the mozzarella, then they would heat it up again and make the ricotta. And then when the whey was still hot from making the ricotta, they would use that hot whey to stretch the mozzarella. So once again, if you're poor and you've got time on your hands, you're gonna come up with all the ways to use all the ingredients you possibly can. Um, so uh, our recipe for ricotta calls for a gallon of milk, one to two uh, teaspoons of granular uh, citric acid, and some salt. And I'm gonna tell you what I do when I'm making my ricotta this way, is I usually go and put, make a little bit extra of my citric acid um, mixture. So I'm gonna do one, two, three teaspoons of my citric acid, and we're going to let this dissolve. Hopefully I'm easy to follow. I've been told I'm like following a cat, so... A lot of commotion happening in the studio space here. If you can, you can't really see, but I think people have decided that they're going to start eating the cheese that we were showing you earlier today. Is that what's happening? Do you need some more sustenance? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so Let's ask started. another question while you're stirring. Um, if anyone was listening. So. Um, I would like to know who was really listening earlier and what kind of milks can we make cheese out of? And the bonus question is if you can be specific. And the more bonus question is can you add another kind of milk that we can make cheese out of that's not on the list? And what do we win for the answers? Oh, let's see. Ooh, since this is a tough question, I think we should win the, the cleaver. <laughs> Show how sharp that is. Oh, by cutting myself? No. Let's <laughs> <laughs> just pull out the plate. Yeah. This thing is so sharp that at our Liberty Station location, I had to put it up on a display so that people wouldn't touch it. But I love this thing. This will cut any cheese like it were butter. Yes. And that's another good class, the butter making class. 
What other classes do we have coming up soon? Ooh, tomorrow, anyone's interested, at 5 o'clock, Rosie Rosés. We're oh. doing it. just cheeses that go great with rosé. Oh. Awesome. I might have to drink for that class. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something you can do with the leftover whey? It's a very good question. Um, there are a lot of things you can do with leftover whey. And I will tell you, do we have any answers to their clue? We do. Oh. May I just say real quick? Yeah. Chantal. Uh -huh. Chantal. Uh -huh. Goat, buffalo, cow, and sheep. Ah. Can we be more specific? What kind of buffalo? Ah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and are there any other animals you can think of that we make that we can make cheese out of? And I will take any right answer and I will tell you right now what a wrong answer is. There is a dairy that is supposedly making cheese out of camel milk, but that's not technically cheese. It's actually more like extra thick yogurt or um, more specifically, extra thick kefir. Um, but it's not an actual truly formed cheese curd. Uh, so if we were talking like, scientifically, is this cheese? The camel milk cheese is not really cheese. Um, anyone? Yes, uh, water buffalo. Water buffalo, yes. that is so the answer. So we do have a winner for Chantel. Yay. Because you probably do not want to try and milk a bison. That would, that would be, be scary. scary. Yes. <laughs> um, anyone, anyone yet want to guess on another another animal type that we can make? Do you want to guess? I do. Guess. What about yak? Yak is the one that I have in my mind. Mm. Um, there is at least one dairy making yak milk cheese. And evidently, it takes something like four people and two hours to get one gallon of yak milk. Which would make how much cheese? Which will make maybe a pound of cheese. <laughs> and so that's a lot of work. And I'm guessing if it takes four people to milk a yak, it's probably an, a relatively dangerous job as well. Do you think you'd be better off with a yak sweater? <laughs> <laughs> I had a yak sweater at one point. Don't judge. <laughs> no. Don't judge. All right, ricotta. While our while our mozzarella curds are chilling, milk. What do we need to make cheese? Milk. What else? Citric acid. Well, acid. 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 Okay. So you could probably use battery acid to make cheese, but I don't know if oh. I eat it later. <laughs> Ew. Um, Heat. Uh, heat. Heat. Ooh, heat. 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 Winner. Roger. Roger. Hey, the cameraman, gets the cameraman for the win. <laughs> um, yes, we need milk, a curdable milk. We need acid and we need heat. So we have our milk and, we, and we're going to add heat and we're going to save adding our acid for much later. So how do you make ricotta fluffy? Let me tell you how we're going to do it first. We're going to heat this up uh, so that it's above 180. Um, most people aim for about 185. And then we're going to add our acid to it. And you're going to watch. It's just going to make cheese just like that. Um, but if we want it fluffy, we would take about half of our citric acid, half to three quarters of the citric acid, that we're going to use, and we would add that right now while the milk is still cold. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a visual to tell you why that makes two different kinds of ricotta. When you're adding the acid first, those curds are forming while the milk is heating up, and what happens when you heat something? Like, picture water heating. What do you see happen? Do you want to guess? Well, the Everything rises. Uh, what do you see in there? Bubbles. Bubbles. So what happens is as the curds are forming, they're actually trapping those little bubbles, and those bubbles are making it fluffy. 
Um, and so you also, if you want to make fluffy ricotta, you would be stirring very little. So the fluffier ricotta, you're really going to want a, to use a double boiler on because you don't want to have to stir it um, really more than getting your acid in there, stirring it fast, and then just kind of moving it around a little bit. Um, but so as the milk, even though it's not boiling, there's still going to be micro bubbles forming in there from the heat source. And those little curds that they're forming are going to form around those bubbles. And you'll see that your ricotta will, as the, as the milk is hotter, sort of rise to the surface. When you add the acid at the end, you're forming the curds really fast. And they don't have, a, they don't have time to trap those bubbles that are, that are in the milk. And so it'll make a denser ricotta. Um, fluffy ricotta is so good. So good. But those are great tips because I was always making the non fluffy type. Yeah. So now I want Which to Which is actually what we're making today. <laughs> um, uh, there is an old chef trick for making fluffy ricotta that is foolproof. Um, I've never seen this fail. If you go to the grocery store and you get a quart of the cultured buttermilk, that actually has enough acid in it to curdle our, our milk. So you just get buttermilk and a gallon of regular milk, mix the two together, heat them up, and it will make beautiful, light, fluffy ricotta. And with the added benefit of having a little extra flavor that is going to come from the buttermilk. Um, so good. So, so And I'm getting hungry talking about all of this. <laughs> Can you go back to what you can do with the whey? Oh, yes, sorry. No, sorry okay. I told you I'm like a cat. So um, my least favorite thing to do with the whey is to give it to your plants. Um, Ooh, but I, that's a mint then, because that's what you always hear. I know. Well, that's my least favorite, because the other ways <laughs> <laughs> are things that I get to enjoy. Well, not all the ways I get to enjoy. The second uh, thing that I hear a lot of people do with their whey is they will feed it to their animals. So cats and dogs both like whey. I have a parrot. She probably likes it, but I haven't given it to her yet. She okay. loves yogurt. She loves yogurt, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm guessing she would like the whey. But I'm stingy. When I have leftover whey, um, uh, the ways that I like to use it is you can use it in your soup. Any place it, where you're gonna use water, you're gonna bake bread, bread needs water, you can use whey um, uh, as a base for soup. Um, what other ways can we use? Rice. Uh, that, I was getting to that. That's I'm my sorry. favorite way. It is really rice. You, did you hear what you said? So I use my whey when making rice, and the rice comes out with this wonderful butter mm -hmm. flavor that is truly to die for. It's, you know, you pull the, Pull the rice out of however you're cooking it, and it's hot buttered rice right there. It's ridiculously good. Um, and you'll see our mozzarella curds are are really kind of firm. You can you know really kind of play with them pretty well now, right? Touch food. <laughs> can you say the most famous um, cheese that the way gets fed to animals? The most famous cheese of the way gets yeah. fed to uh, animals. Yeah. Parmesan. Oh. Uh, prosciutto. Uh, yeah. yeah. Parmesan way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I was thinking of another way that people use way. How many no different way. ways can we use way? Use way. way. <laughs> well, this is How a many good ways question. can you use way? Do you sense? have to use the way quickly? This is a question from Michelle. Um, or can you save the way in the fridge for future? Like, how long could you keep your way? So, like anything else, like like the cheese that we're making, um, there's sort of a timer on it as to when it's going to sour. Um, so, the expiration date that's on your milk is probably still true when you're making mozzarella because the mozzarella is not really gonna get hot enough to pasteurize except when you're stretching, but that's another story. Um, but uh, it's not gonna stay hot long enough to pasteurize it. 
I'm derailing myself a little bit. <laughs> um, the, uh, the ricotta is going to get hot enough to pasteurize. So mm. you're, when you're making mozzarella, the whey is going to probably still have the same expiration date as the milk you started from. With the ricotta, the expiration date is kind of going to start from the time that you make the ricotta. So we're basically pasteurizing the ricotta milk ourselves while we're doing it. Um, but the good news is whey is also freezable. So you can freeze your whey and use it whenever you want. Um, I do have people that ask if they can uh, make their protein powder out of the leftover whey. And that is a long involved process that you can't really do at home. But there's no reason you can't use your whey in your smoothies and things like that. Um, you can make lemonade out of it. And there's so many cool things that you can do with it. Just just try. There is a country, however, that decided to make something um, out of their way. Um, so it's a kind of, they call it a cheese, it's more like a karma. And maybe that should be our next question. Can anyone tell me oh, what, that what is? the name of that? It's a country that makes something out of their way. And uh, it's brown in color. And I'm not going to give any more hints at the moment without giving it away. But what you win is a say cheese pin. This thing is <laughs> awesome. Yes. So a product made of whey. A product that made of whey. From a that country. That we eat. That you can purchase through Venissimo almost any time. It's one of the things it's that we delicious. keep in stock. It's very delicious. I eat it with chocolate. Caramel. Um, I eat it with um, uh, coconut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have another question, Mr. Professor Paul. Okay. Um, shelf life on the rennet tablets and the uh, citric acid. That is a very, very good question. Um, the citric acid, I don't believe that there's a shelf life to it as long as it stays dry. Um, in fact, I bet even if it gets wet, it's still, it's not going to go bad. It's just going to be harder to work with. Um, the tablets, the, uh, the rented tablets that you get, as long as they're in their sealed container, you can put them in the freezer. And I've used tablets that were more than two years old. Um, usually, I believe the manufacturer says not more than a year. But I know that I've used tablets that were way past that, and they were still good. The tablets are very stable. If you're only going to make a little bit of cheese every so often, the tablets are the best route for you to use. They're also the vegetarian rennet. Um, uh, I don't know if there's an animal ta uh, rennet tablet out there. I haven't seen one. But uh, so the vegetarians out there, uh, the, uh, the tablet rennet is good for you, but there's also a liquid rennet, which I honestly prefer to work with at home because I feel that I can get a more precise measurement out of it. And um, uh, I think overall it tends to work a little bit better for my more advanced cheeses, and those are the liquid rennets. And those come in two forms, the animal rennet and the, uh, the vegetable rennet. Those are the ones that are readily available. Um, a word of warning, if you do, or if you are looking at those, they usually uh, come in the same size package for the same amount of money each. But the vegetable rennet, if you read the instructions, um, call for half as much rennet uh, as your make would call for. The makes are usually written for animal rennet, um, so if you're using vegetable rennet, you do need to make that adjustment. If you like to follow recipes exactly the way they're written, and you don't want to have to guess, then almost all recipes are written for animal rennet, uh, unless they specify. Can you so. give a hint? Um Paul, on the, the, the brown whey product question. So, um, what would be a good hint? Should we Which talk country region? Yeah. So, let's say um, it is a Norwegian cheese. Mm. A Norwegian cheese made of whey. A Norwegian cheese made of whey. 
This is really a tougher question than, um, than any of the ones we've had before. It's so good, though. Traditionally, they would take this, what I'm going to tell you, this is almost another hint, and they would slice it and put it on toast and kind of let it sort of melt into the toast, and that sort of becomes breakfast. For me, one of my absolute favorite things to do is I like to get a square of chocolate, and then I put some of this, what I'm talking about, on that square of chocolate, and then I top it with something called cocos, which is a coconut milk gouda. And eat those three together will knock your socks off. <laughs> In fact, if you want to hear a reminiscent story, the first time I walked into a Venissimo, um, the monger made me one of those combinations. <laughs> and that pretty much did me in. Like, Venissimo is now my Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> What do you want to do for your birthday? I want to go to Venissimo. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's awesome. That's and I'm I really like not kidding you. <laughs> that's yeah. why we like it. What do you want to do on your birthday? Yeah, I want to go to Venissimo. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And we have a winner. Oh. We do have a winner. The spelling is a little weird. That's uh, of course, okay. the spell. In fact, I've seen it spelled but. a lot of different ways. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you want to? Do you want to say it? You go ahead. The, the name of the cheese that I'm thinking of is called Yay Toast. And it's it's pronounced like Yay, yay to <laughs> Toast. <laughs> Two things you would love. Yes. <laughs> yay Toast. Uh, what's, what's interesting, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation because that is not my skill set, is Brunos is actually the real name of the cheese, and Yay Toast is the form that is made from goat whey. So Brunos is... Usually if it's called Brunos, it implies that it's made from cow, but both Ye Toast and Brunos are technically the same cheese, Ye Toast being a little more specific, being the goat version. How is that? Yep, yep. perfect. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Who was the winner? Uh, K Goods? I'm not sure. K, 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 K Goods. Goods. Yes. Yay. K Goods. <laughs> Yay. 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 These are so cool. They're so cool. They're so cool. I like them a lot. Um, so what right. should be happening now? You were stirring a right little now, bit or just yeah. occasionally? I'm just stirring enough. So, mm -hmm. so basically, I, I don't like to leave my thermometer in there. Um, so I'm actually looking at the bubbles forming on the surface. And if you're doing this at home, you'll notice that at this point, it's starting to get a little bit kind of foamy on top. And good? so if we were making um, fluffy ricotta, our curds would be trapping that that foam that's almost like latte foam on top, right? Can you see that? Yeah. So our curds would be trapping those micro bubbles as they're forming and making it fluffy. But we aren't making that. We are going to be making a year extra special class bonus today. <coughs> so let's check our temperature. And while we're checking our temperature, I want to fill you in on a cool little thing that most people don't know about thermometers. If you have an analog style thermometer, it usually has a little notch on the back. And you can use that notch to calibrate your thermometer. So you see if I hold that notch and I turn the top, how it changes the temperature? So I know that water boils at 112 degrees, and so I can stick this into yeah. boiling water. Say so what? 212 degrees, sorry. <laughs> 212 degrees. I've been in isolation for way too long. Um, and so I could stick that in boiling water and turn that to 212. Nice. And I could set it at its high point. Or I could take a glass and fill it with ice and put uh, just enough water in there to move it around, stick this in, swirl it, and um, I could adjust that down to 32 degrees. Assuming it's a Fahrenheit thermometer, um, what does what does uh, Celsius? What Celsius. Is hundred water and zero. Hundred. 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 I knew zero, but I know. <laughs> so it looks like we're getting really, we're getting, we're starting to have bubbles form on this. Um, 
but we're only at, my thermometer says right now, 136 degrees. And you said you wanted 180? We're aiming to 180. Okay. So. And again, you gotta do it slow, right? You, can't you know, it's better, slower is better with cheese. Okay. I have made this style of ricotta in less than 15 minutes, I'm gonna say. You know, like, oh, people are coming over, I need to make some cheese. Um, but uh, it's better to go slower. You'll always end up with a better product. So I will tell you guys, I'm gonna give you the quick, the quickest rundown to tell you how easy it is to make yogurt. So um, right now we are all doing this COVID isolation thing or social distancing. And one of the things that my wife and I have been doing is we've been making a lot of yogurt. And so I'll tell you how we make yogurt. One is we start with a little bit of live culture yogurt from the grocery store. Um, you can also buy yogurt cultures um, at Curds and Wine um, or online somewhere. But uh, I just like to start with a good yogurt that I already like because I know that I like that blend of cultures that's in it. Plain yogurt. Right? Plain yogurt. You don't want any sugars or artificial sweeteners or flavorings in it. So start with uh, your favorite brand of plain yogurt. As long as it says live cultures on there, you're good. You heat up your milk to the same temperature that we're heating the ricotta to. So you're gonna aim for 180 to 185. And here's the trick. You're gonna drop it, as soon as you get up to that temperature, you're gonna drop it in an ice bath and you wanna get it down to 110 as fast as possible. And as soon as you get it down to 110, you stir in your yogurt, and then um, I wrap it in a towel and put it on a heating pad. And the heating pad on medium keeps it right around 110 for the six to eight hours it's gonna to take to culture. And then um, uh, at about six hours, you can start to taste it. And when it gets as tangy as you like, then voila, you have yogurt. It's that easy. That is crazy. And you are a renaissance man. You're cooking <laughs> yogurt, pizza dough, uh, uh, all these things, I know. Like, uh -huh. I heard. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can you make yogurt with the ultra-pasteurized milk? Or does that all, should that also be not ultra-pasteurized? So, um, at the risk of confusing people, there are some ultra-pasteurized milks that you can even make the ricotta out of because we're getting it up into 180 degrees anyway, so we're denaturing some of the proteins. So you can uh, make yogurt out of uh, uh, ultra-pasteurized milk or ricotta out of ultra-pasteurized milk, but I, I, I'm apprehensive to say that because it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. If you find a brand that it does work for, then, um, then Golden, stick with that. But, um, uh, I can go down a rabbit hole and confuse people to no end. So one of the other cool things I can say is if you're starting with ultra pasteurized milk and you're making yogurt, you should only need to heat it up to 110 because mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we're heating it up to these ricotta temperatures is we're trying to denature those proteins to make the yogurt. So that might be... This is mad science, Paul. Mad, it's mad science. science. But, <laughs> but think about it this way. Think about how many different uh, types of cheese do you know or other dairy products that we have that are all cultured. And they're all coming from primarily four different kinds of milk. In fact, think about how many different kinds of cheese you can think of that come from just cow milk. So all these little things that we're doing make all the difference in the world at the other end. Um, there are over 4,000 described variants of cheese. Wow. And how many do you think you've tasted? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost, right? Of the varieties? Yeah. yeah. I know, no I've, yak. I know no I've, yak. Tasted, I I've easily tasted over 1,000. Yeah. I don't know if I've tasted 2,000. <laughs> um, but probably close. But probably close. And I know you've tasted way more cheese than I have. Oh my gosh, yeah. It's crazy, it all starts with the milk. It is milk. And it all starts it's with crazy. the milk. It's crazy, I mean, yeah. it's like wine 
grapes and wine. Yeah, grapes. in fact, I was just going to bring up that analogy. Um, there is a saying in winemaking that you can make um, bad wine from good grapes, but you can't make good wine from bad grapes. Yeah. And that's kind of this true also in milk, or in, in cheese making, is the quality of the cheese that you're going to have at the other end has everything to do with the quality of the milk and the cultures that you're using on the front end. Um, there's a lot of people out there that believe that, you know, raw milk is better than pasteurized milk, and I would never be so bold as to agree to that. I would say that pasteurizing is just another tool that we have to change the outcome at the other end. So if you want those wild cultures, then you have to use raw milk for the most part. If you have very specific cultures that are going to introduce um, flavors into your cheese that are the way, you know, exactly what you want, then you're going to want to pasteurize your milk or at least thermalize it. And thermalizing it is, is a, like a low temperature pasteurization. The FDA doesn't consider it pasteurized, but a lot of cheesemakers will heat up their milk into the 130s so that they're sort of cleaning the slate and then making sure that the cultures they want are added after it. Alpine cheeses are quite often in that category. And Alpine cheeses are hands down my favorite family of cheese. The Schnebelhorn that you guys have <laughs> on your sample plate is Schnebelhorn. Um, try to say that three times. <laughs> Schnebelhorn, Schnebelhorn, Schnebelhorn. <laughs> <coughs> the curds are formed. Um, so while I'm straining my ricotta, then that's when, that's about when I would be adding herbs or any flavoring to it, about the time that I add the salt. And that is true also of the mozzarella. Um, I will occasionally make a flavored mozzarella, and what I will do with my flavored mozzarella, if I'm doing something super fun, like uh, mushroom mozzarella. I will buy those, uh, the big thing of um, dried mushrooms and I will grind them up in, in my coffee grinder and I will put them in the gallon of milk the night before I'm gonna make my mozzarella. Then I strain out the mushrooms mm. because they're kind of too firm um, and not a good texture for your cheese and then make my cheese from that milk. Um, it's sort of a brown color in the morning, but that's okay because it's all flavor. Um, uh, I've also, uh, one of my other favorite flavors of mozzarella to make is dill mozzarella. And when I'm doing the dill mozzarella, I will add the dill to the milk the day I'm making it. So about the same time that I'm adding the acid, I'll add dill to it. Um, another type of uh, mozzarella that is my absolute favorite and you might think this is gross at first, but that's only because you haven't tried it, is green tea mozzarella. And I will infuse my milk with green tea the night before, and then strain, uh, strain out any, any chunks that might be in, and then make my mozzarella out of that green tea milk, and it tastes like a green tea latte. It is spectacular. And it is so good with like, melon, like honeydew, cantaloupe, and green tea mozzarella, but it is all equally good with the tomato and the basil that you would usually have mozzarella with. Um, alrighty guys and gals, we are at 180.4 degrees, and so we're going to turn that off. And at this point, um, you're going to uh, maybe zoom in on the, with the camera because wait till you see how this goes. So we have our milk, it's at temperature, our citric acid that we've pre-made and I'm going to pour about half of the citric acid in first. And why half again? Uh, half because I just want to use as little acid as possible to make 
my cheese, but if oh, half fine. is enough to 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 form the curds, then half is all you need. Oh, I can see the way you see that? separated straight so away. So we're going to yeah. give that straight away. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to give that a few minutes to see uh, just how much curd will form out of that. While that's happening, I am going to pour the whey out of my basket because we're going to need this. And I don't want to make too much of a mess. All right, back to our ricotta. Let's look. And that is looking beautiful. Doesn't that look wonderful? And you'll see, if you were making fluffy, fluffy mozzarella, these cur or ricotta, these curds that form would be a little bit bigger than this. These are tighter forming. And I'm going to add just a little bit more acid to it because... Um, if you're doing this at home, you might see that there's still some cloudiness to the way. I don't know if you, it reads on the camera very well, but there's still some cloudiness in the way. I know that there's a little bit more ricotta to get out of there. So, so I'm going to do a half again. I'm going to do just a little bit more acid. And look at how wonderful that is. Oh, that is fabulous. That looks fluffy still. And if we go back to our discussion about um, burrata, another fun thing to do is make flavored ricotta and use that inside of your burrata. It's not te technically burrata at that point, but it sure is yummy. All right. All that, what happened to all your milk? <laughs> I, am, I am moving our mozzarella to the side. I'm not going to it. Yeah. What happened to all of our milk? Yeah, you, you had a gallon of milk, and did you see the ball that just yep. popped out of there? For a, gallon, for a gallon of milk, you're really only going to end up with about a pound of cheese. When you're doing a soft, fresh cheese, for the firmer cheeses, like if you're making uh, uh, gouda or, uh, or cheddar, the ratio is even less. So, can I pour this without making too much of a mess yeah. over there? Do you think the camera people are going to mind if I just go over to the sink and do this? Nope, you can, the camera can follow you. Let's do this in the sink because I know me all too well. That's perfect. Oh, look at that. So, you're not being so dainty this time. You don't have to? No, nope. ricotta is tough. Ricotta can withstand all of the pain and suffering we can we can send to it. So we're just going to let this drain in the sink, and we're going to move over to our mozzarella. And Paul, if they don't have a second cheesecloth, can you move the mozzarella straight to a bowl? You can move the mozzarella straight to a bowl. In fact, um, is there anybody out there that doesn't have a microwave? So if there's anybody out there that doesn't have a microwave, let me know, because there's a few different ways that we can stretch mozzarella. And if you do have a microwave, if everyone has a microwave, I'd like you to show you the way that I like to do it at home, because we have a microwave here. Do we have a glass bowl? And truth be known, even when I'm making traditional mozzarella, I stretch my mozzarella in the microwave because it works so well all the time and then I'm not playing with as much hot liquid um, as I would be if I'm stretching it the traditional way. So I will tell you how to do it the traditional way anyway, right? But are, are we good? We're good. Cool. Look at that curd. It's firmer yeah. than I expected. So, and you notice this was coming from uh, milk that we saw the curds were looking a little bit sketchy. And yet, a little extra time, a little extra patience, and just letting it hang out for a little bit and drying the cheesecloth, and we now have some fairly firm curds here. Um, yeah. Before we stretch the mozzarella, I want to uh, just remind you our ricotta is draining in the sink, so I'm not draining all over everywhere. 
but I'm going to give you another um, piece of advice that is worth every bit that you could have paid for this class, and that is how to clean up. So if we go back to what are the things that we need to make cheese? We need acid, we need milk, we need heat. So a lot of people think that they're going to use hot water to clean their cheese gear. Don't do that. Use cool to cold water to clean your cheese equipment. And the reason for that is if you picture the curds, uh, or if you think that the surface of your pots and pans aren't perfectly smooth. They may look smooth to your eye, but there's, there's little micro crevices all in that steel and on your spoons and all that. So if you add hot water to those, those curds are going to shrink. They're going to expel more weight because we're adding more heat to it. And so they're actually going to adhere themselves to your pot and your spoons and stuff. So use cool water to get the chunks out. Then you can go at it with your soap and warm water. All these years I've been doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, and it makes a difference. Oh, I found the other rennet tablet that we were looking for earlier. I guess we have to start all over again. <laughs> so how is everybody have the Everybody's ready. Everyone's yep. good at this good. point? So um, I, uh, we, we really just want to get this up around 140, 160 degree. Uh, temperature range. I never use a thermometer for uh, for stretching curds because they're either going to stretch or they're not going to stretch. They're either at the right temperature and the right acidity or it's just not going to work. <coughs> what I don't want to do is I don't want to overheat them. Um, I don't want to put them in the microwave for so long that I've actually melted my cheese. So pushing the button start button once this 30 seconds. Say what? Push the start button once 30 seconds. Cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to set it. Oh, no, it only goes up. Well, oh, oh, oh I see. Does it okay. So I'm setting it now for about two minutes, and I'm going to check it at about a minute because everyone's microwave is a little bit different. Um, uh, and while we're doing that, I'm going to get my salt ready. I make enough cheese that I have a big bag of salt. <laughs> I will also tell you, salt is so good, sweet fat and salty fat. <laughs> um, so I will tell you a little bit about salt. When you're making advanced cheeses, you want to make sure that you're using a non-iodized salt. So I usually uh, get salt that is co uh, the kosher salt. There are two brands out there that are readily available. One has an anti-caking agent in it and the other one doesn't. Um, I prefer to use the one that doesn't, but either of them work. The anti-caking agent is not going to affect your cheese. So at one minute, you'll see that we're releasing more whey. So what we're going to do at this point is I'm going to work it just a little bit more. See that? See, it's almost turning like rubber, right? That's so beautiful. So it's starting to cool off a little bit. So I'm going to take... Um, uh, and salt this, and we're going to salt it to taste. I am a salt fiend, um, but I never measure my salt. I just put it in, but what I gave you uh, in the recipe is a good starting point. FYI, that's my recipe for mozzarella, and um, it's worked for me for years and years and years. So it's getting a little bit tough, but you notice, like if you ever make dough, how you'll fold the dough underneath. That's how I stretch my mozzarella. I just fold it underneath with my fingers. It's gorgeous. And you see how it's getting shiny? It's getting shiny that tells us that we're overworking it. So I am going to put this in the microwave, warm it up just a little bit more so I can get that salt to incorporate. And then we will check on our ricotta. <coughs> And since it's already kind of warm, we're going to go maybe 30 seconds this time. How are people doing at home with that? Good. Overworking your mozzarella will make it tougher and tougher and tougher. Which is fine if you're making pizza, but it's not fine if you want to eat it with um, tomatoes and crackers. 
actually. I'm more of a bread person. I see. You know, I like to make crostinis and stuff. You see how shiny that is? Mm -hmm. Shiny means that we are done stretching it. So That's if you're good. at this point, you should probably just let it rest. Smooth and shiny. Uh, I just want to show you that I'm not doing this with it. <laughs> right? This is not what you want to do at home. Do you see that? But I want to show you that, that, that we've made mozzarella out of bad milk that is capable of doing this stretch. If you were talented, you could turn this into a braid, which I can't really do. But I'm going to show you real quick. Um, if you wanted to make burrata, you would take a, a thin sheet like that, put it, in, put it in your hand, put a ball of whatever ingredients you want to put in the middle, form it around, twist it off, and you would have burrata. It's that easy. Do we want to eat some of this? Yes. <laughs> Okay, bye. <laughs> uh, we need to check on our, our ricotta. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're a little yes, over. Yes, we're a little over. That's okay. Sorry, guys, but we're almost done. And if you are going to make paneer or ricotta salada out of it, um, you're going to want maybe even to let it strain out even more than this. But I'm going to show you, since we're a little low on time, uh, the next steps that I would use to make paneer. If you're going to salt it or uh, flavor it, now is the time to do that. So like I said, I like salt, so let's salt it now. And then salt does a really cool thing, um, and, it's, and, it's, and what salt does is great in the cheese world. Um, you've heard of brining. Brining, they'll take cheese and they'll soak it in salt water. And what salt does that's really awesome is salt likes to be equal all the way through whatever it's in. And so if you soak cheese in a brine, the salt is gonna wanna find uh, uh, an equalness throughout the cheese and the brine, so the cheese will start to absorb that salt. So we don't necessarily have to mix salt in all that well if cheese is going to age forever, but your make is actually going to tell you in some cases um, dry salt it or brine it or just put salt on the surface. But rest assured, no matter what method of salting you're using, it's going to find its way all the way through your cheese. So the traditional way to make paneer, does everyone know what paneer is? Paneer is an Indian style cheese, India Indian, and um, it is grillable and sauteable. It doesn't melt and it's delicious and it's what's for dinner. <laughs> so tra <laughs> traditionally, they would just take their ricotta, they weren't calling it ricotta, but they would take the ricotta, that, like what we just made, and wrap it in cheesecloth, tie a knot on the top, and just put a brick on top of that. And that is gonna press and knit together and form paneer. And I will let you in on a cool little trick. If you don't have a fancy cheese weight, you can take that empty uh, container from your milk, and if you fill it up with water, you now have an eight pound weight that you could set on top of your cheese and that will press it for you. That is a hot tip. It is a hot <laughs> tip. Um, I like to use my cheese form because I'm a little bit weird about having my food be perfect. And if you use a form to press it, it's actually going to end up in a nice even shape. Um, depends on what you want on the other end. This part of the form is called a follower. And I will usually just set this in the sink right like this. 
and we can put the weight right on top of it. And um, at some point, I will usually hear a crashing in my sink, and that's because it was maybe off center and that fell over. But don't worry, just put it back on top and you're good to go. And if you let that press for about two to three hours, you'll end up with really great paneer. Um, another trick for good paneer is if you have the forethought of making it the night before and you let it sit in your fridge, it actually takes on a really beautiful smooth texture all the way through. Um, and while we're at it, let's talk about ricotta salata. Does everyone know what ricotta salata is? Has anyone had ricotta salata? Are people responding? No ricotta salatas yet. No. Ricotta salata is a cheese that you can uh, make at home, very easy, and it is gratable, so you can use it almost in lieu of Parmesan if, you're, don't, if you can't make it to Venissimo that day and you have to have some grated cheese on whatever you're eating. Um, uh, but it is, for all intents and purposes, it's paneer that is then salted and aged in your fridge for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the recipe that I gave you uh, under um, ricotta salata, it's one of these pages, it was one of these pages. Ah, ricotta salata. If you follow that recipe, um, it will make perfect ricotta salata every single time. The only trick to um, aging cheese, any cheese, and especially the ricotta salata, is it is going to continue to release whey. And two things. One is you want to have it in something that's going to catch the whey, so you don't have whey dripping off through your vegetables and, and other things in your, in your fridge. But you also want to um, make sure that it's not sitting in the whey. So what I do is I have a little piece of mesh <coughs> and I use some of the lids from the, from the excess milk containers and I put down the, the little lids and put the mesh on top and then I can put my cheese on top of that and it gives me a good you know quarter to half inch of, of whey collection before, before I have to worry about mm -hmm. anything. That's it. That's it. Yay. I love it. Any questions? Um, yeah, any last minute questions out there? Any last minute um, questions in here? <coughs> no. Do you want to do one more um, trivia just to give, um, actually a specialty, I'd like to give a shout out to them since we were supposed to host the class there so today. Let me tell you how awesome specialty produce is. Specialty produce loans out their kitchen they have um, a test kitchen that they loan out to various chefs uh, that are maybe opening up a new restaurant or they want to try um, some new recipes or, or uh, develop recipes um, and they don't have the space in their restaurant to do it. Specialty actually just loans out their kitchen to these, to these folks. And one of the wonderful things that Specialty has done is Specialty has loaned out their, their kitchen for us to hold these cheese classes in. So um, in the future, if you ever decide you want to take a mozzarella ricotta making class again, and uh, our restrictions are lifted, um, you can also uh, check out the specialty uh, warehouse. Um, my favorite thing about the specialty warehouse isn't um, all the wonderful produce and stuff that they have. It's this amazing collection of photos. Um, my understanding, please jump in if I get this incorrect, but the, the, uh, the gentleman who owns Specialty Produce travels the world looking for fruits and vegetables that um, are unique. And he takes photos of these and he puts them up, he calls it uh, his museum, um, but it is, you, uh, I, I'm blown away. Uh, there are maybe 30 different kinds of avocados in there. I don't know how many tomatoes. It's yeah. crazy, really good. crazy. Check them out. Um, so check that out. Um, should we, let's do a, a slightly easier yeah. question for this. Mm -hmm. How old is Venissimo? How long Ooh. is Venissimo <laughs> been around? Yes, it is. And in the meantime, Paul, while people are thinking how old Benissimo is, 
Um, ice bath for the mozzarella, should that go in now to form the mozzarella? Uh, so let's ice. talk about the ice bath. As you noticed, I did not use an ice bath. Um, uh, in Italy, uh, they usually will not use an ice bath for their mozzarella. The reason why is if you drop it in an ice bath, uh, it will actually form a skin. Now, a skin is great if you are going to um, uh, maybe make it use it for pizza. So if I'm making pizza out of it, then I will definitely drop it in an ice bath because I want it to I want to cool it off before I melt it again. <laughs> but um, when I'm making mozzarella for me to eat, I just let it cool off naturally. And so this I'm just going to eat in the next five minutes. Five minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> so I didn't use an ice bath. You can absolutely use an ice ice bath. Um, I find the ice bath is really good if you are. Uh, making burrata because you kind of want to toughen up that skin a little bit. Um, I find the ice bath is good if you're making small uh, round balls of mozzarella and you want them to hold their shape because what you'll notice is kind of like Play-Doh. If you hold on to this, it's going to keep drooping and getting sadder and sadder. <laughs> um, uh, so if you're concerned about what its presentation looks like, then you'll also want to use an ice bath. Um, and then one more thing I was going to say about that, and I don't know where it went. Um, I have no idea what I was going to say. So how are we doing on the guesses for the specialty card? We've got the winner at Chantel, Chantel. 2004. Chantel's on it today. <laughs> 2004. Can you believe that? Benissimo has been selling artisan cheeses to the San Diego community since 2004. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Way to go. We can't do, we have to do virtual, like virtual. distance hugging right yes. now. But everybody, Paul, yeah. if you've got more questions, Paul at Benissimo.com. you got questions for me, Gina at Benissimo.com. So appreciate you tuning in as we're learning and doing more of these. We have a virtual tasting tomorrow at 5. You can tune in if you just want to hear what cheeses go good with rosé. we got one on Tuesday that goes around the world of wines at 5 o'clock. Um, you can see all of this on the website. And again, to Paul, to his lovely assistant with me, and to our cameraman, Roger. And to all of you out there, eat cheese, stay healthy. Love you. Bye.